All right, well, good morning, everyone. It is uh, good to be with you today. And today we are reading March the 25th, uh, so Joshua chapter 10. And so um, this is Israel defeats the southern kings. Adonai Zedek, the king of Jerusalem, heard that Joshua had captured and completely destroyed Ai and killed its king, just as he had destroyed the town of Jericho and killed its king. He also learned that the Gibeonites had made peace with Israel and were now their allies. He and his people became very afraid when they heard all this because Gibeon was a large town, as large as the royal cities and larger than I. And the Gibeonite men were strong warriors. So King Adonai Zedek of Jerusalem sent messengers to several other kings, Hoham of Hebron, Piram of Jermuth, Japhiah of Lachish, and Deber of Eglon. Come and help me destroy Gibeon, he urged them. For they have made peace with Joshua and the people of Israel. So these five Amorite kings combined their armies for a united attack. They moved all their troops into place and attacked Gibeon. The men of Gibeon quickly sent messengers to Joshua at his camp in Gilgal. Don't abandon your servants now, they pleaded. Come at once, save us, help us. For all the Amorite kings who live in the hill country have joined forces to attack us. So Joshua and his entire army, including his best warriors, left Gilgal and set out for Gibeon. Do not be afraid of them, the Lord said to Joshua, for I have given you victory over them. Not a single one of them will be able to stand up to you. Joshua traveled all night from Gilgal and took the Amorite armies by surprise. The Lord threw them, threw them into a panic, and the Israelites slaughtered a great number of them at Gibeon. Then the Israelites chased the enemy along the road to Beth Horon, killing them all along the way to Ezekiah and Mechida. Um, as the Amorites retreated down the road from Beth Horon, the Lord destroyed them with a terrible hailstorm from heaven that continued until they reached Ezekiel. The hail killed more of the enemy than the Israelites killed with the sword. On the day the Lord gave the Israelites victory over the Amorites, Joshua prayed to the Lord in front of all the people of Israel. He said, let the sun stand still over Gibeon and the moon over the valley of Ajalon. So the sun stood still and the moon stayed in place until the nation of Israel had defeated its enemies. Is this event not recorded in the book of Jashar? The sun stayed in the middle of the sky and it did not set as on a normal day. There has never been a day like this one before or since when the Lord answered such a prayer. Surely the Lord fought for Israel that day. Then Joshua and the Israelite army returned to their camp at Gilgal. Uh, Joshua kills the five southern kings, Joshua chapter 10, verse 16. During the battle, the five kings escaped and hid in a cave at Makeda. When Joshua heard that they had been found, he issued this command, cover the opening of the cave with large rocks and, and place guards at the entrance to keep the kings inside. The rest of you continue chasing the enemy um, and cut them down from the rear. Don't give them a chance to get back to their towns, for the Lord your God has given you victory over them. So Joshua and the Israelite army continued the slaughter and completely crushed the enemy. They totally wiped out the five armies, except for a tiny remnant that managed to reach their fortified towns. Then the Israelites returned safely to Joshua in the camp at Makeda. After that, no one dared to speak even a word against Israel. Then Joshua said, remove the rocks covering the opening of the cave and bring the five kings to me. So they brought the five kings out of the cave, the kings of Jerusalem, Hebron, Jarmuth, Lachish, and Eglon. When they brought them out, Joshua told the commanders of his army, come and put your feet on the king's necks. And they did as they were told. Don't ever be afraid or discouraged, Joshua told his men. Be strong and courageous, for the Lord is going to do this to all your enemies. Then Joshua killed each of the five kings and impaled them on five sharpened poles, where they hung until evening. As the sun was going down, Joshua gave instructions for the bodies of the kings to be taken down from the poles and thrown into the cave where they had been hiding. Then they covered the opening of the cave with a pile of large rocks, which remains to this very day. Israel destroys the southern cities. That same day, Joshua captured and destroyed the town of Makeda. He killed everyone in it, including the king, leaving no survivors. He destroyed them all, and he killed the king of Makeda as he had killed the king of Jericho. Then Joshua and the Israelites went to Libna and attacked it. There, too, the Lord gave them the town and its king. He killed everyone in it, leaving no survivors. Then Joshua killed the king of Libna as he had killed the king of Jericho. From Libna, Joshua and the Israelites went to Lachish and attacked it. Here again the Lord gave them Lachish. Joshua took it on the second day and killed everyone in it, just as he had done at Libna. 
During the attack on Lachish, King Horam of Gezer arrived with his army to help defend the town. But Joshua's men killed him and his army, leaving no survivors. Then Joshua and the Israelite army went on to Eglon and attacked it. They captured it that day and killed everyone in it. He completely destroyed everyone, just as he had done at Lachish. From Eglon, Joshua and the Israelite army went up to Hebron and attacked it. They captured the town and killed everyone in it, including its king, leaving no survivors. They did the same thing to all of its surrounding villages. And just as he had done at Eglon, he completely destroyed the entire population. Then Joshua and the Israelites turned back and attacked Eber. He captured the town, its king, and all its surrounding villages. He completely destroyed everyone in it, leaving no survivors. He did to Deber and its king just as what he had done to Hebron and Libna and, and its king. So Joshua conquered the whole region, the kings and people of the hill country, the Negev, the western foothills, and the mountain slopes. He completely destroyed everyone in the land, leaving no survivors, just as the Lord, the God of Israel, had commanded. Joshua slaughtered them from Kadesh, Barnea, to Gaza, and from the region around the town of Goshen up to Gibeon. Joshua conquered all these kings and their land in a single campaign, for the Lord, the God of Israel, was fighting for his people. Then Joshua and the Israelite army returned to their camp at Gilgal. When King Jabin of Hazor heard what had happened, he sent messengers to the following kings, King Jobab of Maiden, the king of Shimron, the king of Ekshav, all the kings of the northern hill country, the kings in the Jordan Valley, south of Galilee, the kings in the Galilean foothills, the kings of Naphoth Dor on the west, the kings of Canaan, both east and west, the kings of the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perivites, the Jebusites in the hill country, and the Hivites in the towns on the slopes of Mount Hermon in the land of Mizpah. All these kings came out to fight. Their combined armies formed a vast horde. And with all their horses and chariots, they covered the landscape like the sand on the seashore. The kings joined forces and established their camp around the water near Merom to fight against Israel. Then the Lord said to Joshua, do not be afraid of them. By this time tomorrow, I will hand all of them over to Israel as dead men. Then you must cripple their horses and burn their chariots. So Joshua and all his fighting men traveled to the water near Merom and attacked suddenly. And the Lord gave them victory over their enemies. The Israelites chased them as far as Greater Sidon and Misrapheth, Misrapheth, Maim, and eastward into the Valley of Mizpah, until not one enemy warrior was left alive. Then Joshua crippled the horses and burned all the chariots as the Lord had instructed. Joshua then turned back and captured Hazor and killed its king. Hazor had at one time been the capital of all of these kingdoms. The Israelites completely destroyed every living thing in the city, leaving no survivors. Not a single person was spared, and then Joshua burned the city. Joshua slaughtered all the other kings and their people, completely destroying them, just as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded. But the Israelites did not burn any of the towns built on mounds except Hazor, which Joshua burned. And the Israelites took all the plunder and livestock of the rav ravaged towns for themselves, but they killed all the people, leaving no survivors. As the Lord had commanded his servant Moses, so Moses commanded Joshua, and Joshua did, as he was told, carefully obeying all the commands that the Lord had given to Moses. So Joshua conquered the entire region, the hill country, the entire Negev, the whole area around the town of Goshen, the western foothills, the Jordan Valley, the mountains of Israel, and Galilean foothills. The Israelite territory now extended all the way from Mount Halak, which leads up to Seir in the south, as far north as Baal Gad at the foot of Mount Hermon in the valley of Lebanon. Joshua killed all the kings of those territories, waging war for a long time to accomplish this. No one in the region made peace with the Israelites except the Hivites of Gibeon. All the others were defeated, for the Lord hardened their hearts and caused them to fight the Israelites, so they were completely destroyed without mercy, as the Lord had commanded Moses. During the, this period, Joshua destroyed all the descendants of Enoch, who lived in the hill country of Hebron, Deber, Anab, and the entire hill country of Judah and Israel. He killed them all and completely destroyed their towns. None of the descendants of Enoch were left in all the land of Israel, though some still remained in Gaza, Gath, and Ashdod. So Joshua took control of the entire land, just as the Lord had instructed Moses. He gave it to the people of Israel as their special possession, dividing the land among the tribes, so the land finally had rest from war. Joshua 12. These are the kings east of the Jordan River who had been killed by the Israelites and whose land was taken. Their territory extended from the Arnon Gorge to Mount Hermon and included all the land east of the Jordan Valley. King Sihon of the Amorites, who lived in Eshbon, was defeated. His kingdom included Eror 
on the edge of the Arnon Gorge and extended from the middle of the Arnon Gorge to the Jabbok River, which serves as a border for the Ammonites. This territory included the southern half of the territory of Gilead. Sihon also controlled the Jordan Valley and regions to the east, from as far north as the Sea of Galilee to as far south as the Dead Sea, including the road to Beth Jeshemoth and southward to the slopes of Pisgah. King Og of Bashan, the last of the Raphites, lived at Ashtaroth and Edri. He ruled a territory stretching from Mount Hermon to Salika in the north and to all of Bashan in the east and westward to the borders of the kingdoms of Geshur, uh, Geshur and Mekah. This territory included the northern half of Gilead as far as the border of King Sihon of Heshbon. Moses, the servant of the Lord, and the Israelites had destroyed the people of King Sihon and King Og. And Moses gave their land as a possession to the tribes of Reuben, Gad, and the half tribe of Manasseh. All right, so uh, so the Israelites, they are pushing in and they're pushing. Um, any of those that would retreat uh, would be able to, but the kings were conspiring together to fight against Israel and God had given them instructions to completely wipe them out, to not make treaties with them, uh, to do away with uh, the, with their pagan um, idol worship and uh, making sure that they were not, um, you know, infected by the same type of, um, you know, sin sickness. Um, I know it's difficult to uh, to read about them uh, completely destroying everything in those towns, but again, stepping back and asking the question of what you know, what does God see that we don't see? What does God see about um, you know the insidious reality of of idol worship and pagan worship in a complete society that has completely, completely gone um, away from God. See, we don't understand that, you know, a society. In, in fact, you know, because we, uh, in many ways, while we have a society that has, um, you know, really um, slid tremendously uh, from our moral, um, our moral compass, our moral base, uh, what's amazing is, you know, we still have a, a strong remnant of, you know, believers um, in this uh, in this country. And imagine if all of all of the believers, all of those who have, you know, um, Judeo Christian beliefs as the foundation of our morals. Um, imagine if if all of those were now gone. If the witness of God was gone in a community completely, um, how devastating that would be. You know, w imagine you've probably heard of movies like The Purge and, you know, other types of movies like that, that uh, yeah, people are just kind of unleashed and given the, uh, you know, the freedom in a certain time frame to be able to uh, to do anything that they want to. Well, imagine a society where that is the case all the time, where there are no rules, everybody's doing as they see fit, fit and, uh, you know, there is every type of immoral behavior uh, that is sanctioned within a culture and a community. Um, and so, you know, in, in many ways, you see God uh, having to, in, in, in some ways, do to communities the same way that uh, God had uh, cleansed the entire world when he uh, caused the floods to come and starting over with Noah and his family. Um, in this way, God is, is still raining down, uh, you know, this, this, this purification um, of a region where his people are coming in and settling in. And so it helps us again understand uh, a little bit as to what it is that God is attempting to do um, in making sure that the land is is purged of that kind of evil. Okay, so, all right, well, we, we're, we're seeing the Israelites move in. Joshua is a, is a fighting man. He's a warrior. Uh, that, that God has raised him up to to take the Israelites into the promised land and uh, to, to to lay conquest to it. And uh, so eventually they will settle in and they will divide up the land uh, by everybody to everybody. So that's uh, that's going to be coming tomorrow. So um, we'll see how they divide the land. And, you know, then uh, then what happens after that, um, you know, obviously is, uh, you know, they continue to. Uh, to make conquest um, throughout the uh, throughout the area, but the next couple of days is going to be us spending time seeing how the land is actually allotted to the twelve tribes. Well, the eleven tribes of Israel, 
well, not really, because we've got Manasseh and Reuben and Gad that are across on the east side of the Jordan, but they will be included in the listing of how the land is divided. So, all right, well, let's pray together, and uh, then we'll finish up, and we'll we'll uh, uh, we'll see each other again tomorrow. Father, thank you so much for this day. Thank you, Lord, for um, you know God the plans that you have for us, Lord. We uh, we submit ourselves to you, and Lord, we just we thank you for the opportunity we have to uh, to read your word to learn, to digest it, to understand. And uh, Father, we pray that uh, even as we have read today, God, that you would um, open our minds and open our hearts to um, to what it is, Lord, that you are, uh, that you were attempting to do with the Israelite people in the chosen land. And God, even what you're wanting to do with us, God, even as you call us to uh, to purify our hearts, God, to uh, to be completely cleansed of uh, the things that uh, that would not bring you honor, would not bring you glory, the Lord, that we would be sanctified to you, that we would uh, be surrendered to you, that we would put to death the uh, the acts of the flesh. God, you've told us that in your word, Lord, that we would uh, that, that we would treat it serious, Lord, our pursuit of you, the love of you, God, um, and, and Lord, to, uh, to to truly be living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to you. And, and so, God, help us to do that. Help us to um, you know, to treat with seriousness those those places where uh, where sin uh, has taken up residency in our lives, Lord, where we are uh, where we're tempted, God, and and uh, Lord, help us to not give root, Lord, to the enemy uh, being being able to work in our lives, Lord. If, is if there's any place in our hearts in our lives, God, if there's any wickedness in us, Lord, would you point it out by your Holy Spirit? And would you help us, Lord, to uh, to crucify uh, the old man uh, so that we can say, like the Apostle Paul said, for I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And uh, Lord, help us to uh, to be able to say that. Christ, would you live in us? Live in us, Christ. And uh, help us, Lord, to, uh, to put to death uh, the old man and come alive fully in you, God. And thank you, Lord, that as we do that, Lord, you you raise us up to a new life. You give us new attitudes, like the Beatitudes that you spoke of in the, of in the Sermon of the Mount. You you, you give us uh, new attitudes and a new heart, Lord. Put a, put a new heart in us. We ask you, put a new heart in us. Help us, Lord, not to, uh, uh, to, to go soft on sin in us. We thank you, Lord, that we are saved by grace through faith in you. And, Lord, we have faith, God, that not only can we be forgiven of sin, but Lord, that you can give us victory over sin, Lord, because you've come to uh, to redeem us. You've come to, uh, to to change us, Lord. You tell us that if anyone's in, one is in new in Christ, they are a new creation, and the old is gone, and all things become new. And Lord, we accept that all, that all things, God, you want to become new. And Lord, help us to walk in that newness uh, with you. Thank you, Lord, for each one. I pray your blessing over them today, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, God bless you. I hope you have a great day and uh, we'll see you back here tomorrow. All right. Have a wonderful day.